Hey everybody! Lately on this channel, I've been talking a lot about the benefits and state of home labbing. I think it's time to fire up a shell and get some work done. So today, I'm going to be setting up my newest project, a Raspberry Pi Kubernetes cluster. If you aren't familiar, Kubernetes is an orchestration platform for containers, not unlike those that you would run in Docker. This allows you to have highly available applications that use a shared storage and can manage multiple copies of an application behind a load balancer. Now, I'm pretty new to Kubernetes, and I will not be deploying what I would consider to be a beginner-friendly method, so don't treat this video as a guide. This is more of how I'm doing it, why I'm doing it, and all the mistakes that I'm likely to make along the way. For reference before we get too far, I will be using K3S, which is the lightweight version of Kubernetes, and I will be deploying as much as possible using only Ansible. Why Ansible? Well, one of my goals for my 2024 home lab is to utilize more of the fundamentals of infrastructure as code. Meaning that rather than configuring each independent server and system within my lab, they will instead be defined by some code that is stored as a manifest or a YAML file that can be called by the relevant tool to provision the resources needed for me. This has a few benefits. First, everything is repeatable. During any part of the process, I can re-image these pies and I can redeploy the exact steps taken to configure them as they were. It also means that all steps are already documented. I never have to guess if I did something as it will be clearly defined in the code. Now, there are readily available and very well-made Ansible projects out there for deploying Kubernetes and pre-configuring it with all the necessary features to have a great experience. Techno Tim did this exact thing in Ansible and released it for your use. If you're looking to deploy a proper K3S lab with Rancher and Metal LB, I will link that repo and video in the description. But in my case, I don't know why I would want Rancher or Metal LB over what comes included in K3S. I don't know that much about K3S to make that decision. So I'm going to install the most minimal configuration and build up to what I need for my environment. This is definitely the long way around, and I may end up at the exact conclusion that Tim did. Heck, I may even end up using his playbook at the end of this. But for today, our goal is to provision these pies, get them into a K3S cluster, and, and not necessarily run any workload yet. First is the easy part, hardware assembly. I had a few pies on hand that I already plan to use for this project. Now you can easily just do this in VMs, but I really wanted to do this in hardware as the whole point of Kubernetes is the orchestration of hardware across failure zones such as physical hosts and the ability to scale across resources. It just felt more real to me to do it this way. So I added a couple more Pi 4 4 gigabyte models to my collection and some new PoE hats and got to assembling. The rack mount I'm using is from Uktronics and so are the PoE hats. I've had good luck with these, and so I will continue to use them. I have links to the hardware I used in this video in the description as well. Now, the pies that I have on hand were using an older PoE hat that did not include a fan, so I printed these adapter brackets and added a pair of 5-volt fans. The new one's already included a 5-volt fan. Uh, you can see the difference here. This setup will be in a cool room with moderate airflow, but I wanted to add some direct air current across the CPUs. I ran into one hiccup along the way with one 5 volt fan that was trying to start the Circuit Slinger space program with how much thrust it wanted to generate, but the other four in the pack were fine. I guess this is the risk of using cheap electronics. Oh well. With the pies racked up, it was time to add storage. I intend to use Longhorn, which is a local storage provider for K3S, meaning each pie will have its own storage and then Longhorn will keep copies of my data across any number of the pies with storage. This way, should I lose a node, I can still keep my data redundant on the other nodes. For this, we will be using these low profile flash drives. There should be enough space for what we are intending to do. Next, I flash the SD cards using Pi Imager. We will be using the 64 bit Ubuntu server. I intend to manage these headless so we don't need a fancy GUI. And I went ahead with the long term service channel, just personal preference. After adding my public key and setting the host names, it was time to flash the image to the Pi's again, and again, and again. All right, now for the moment of truth. I connected all the pies to my PoE switch, and nothing. 
Okay. No need to panic. I logged into the switch and realized I needed to turn on PoE for each port. I keep these disabled by default until I know I'm connecting something to PoE. Next, I monitored the DHCP server on my firewall and saw three come online. Well, that's not good. A quick check of the rack, and sure enough, one of the pies is not getting a link light. I tried swapping the cable, the port, even reseating the PoE hat. The power light is on, the fan spins, but it's not getting a link. I even re-imaged the SD card and nothing. Unfortunately, I cannot find my adapter to hook this up to my KVM, so that's a problem for another day. We can still get this cluster going with three nodes. Back to the firewall. I reserved static IP addresses for the Pies, reset them so that they would come up with their new IPs, tested that my credentials worked, and got started on the fun part of today's task, the automation. First, I'm gonna run my Netbox playbook this will just add descriptions and manual DNS information of these nodes to Netbox and Unbound DNS that I run on my local network. I'm working on a playbook that will allow some more network automation between OpenSense and Netbox, but I'm waiting on an API update in OpenSense that's supposed to release later this year. You know that I will be making a video on it as soon as I have it at least somewhat operational. So, these playbooks will only do the required operations. Each task within the playbook will check if it needs to be done, then run if it does need to be done. And looking at the output of our terminal here in Visual Studio Code, we can see that the yellow tasks are for those that have changed, green are those that did not need to be completed, and red will be for those that failed. This will depend on how you write your playbook though. This is why I try to write each task in a way that it checks for the state, presence, or requirement of the task before it runs. For example, I could write a task that just says run apt-get install net tools, but this means that this task will run each time the playbook runs, and it will take longer. Instead, this apt task that I'm using here, that each of these applications on this list of packages are up to date, and if they are, it will just move on. You'll notice I'm pasting whole blocks of text into this playbook. This is because I am pulling tasks from other playbooks that I have. There's no reason to recreate each task each time I build a new playbook if I already have it stored somewhere else. So, after we install packages, Next, we're going to do a full system update. Let's make sure these pies are totally up to date. The downside of this particular task in this playbook is that if I rerun this playbook in the future to configure a single new node, since this playbook targets each of the pies, all of them will install any updates. Just something to consider when you're deciding what tasks to include in your playbook. Next, we will check if the system requires a reboot and execute that reboot if so. This also takes quite a lot of time in Ansible as you have to wait for the SSH connection for Ansible to reestablish after the reboot. So again, really important to make sure that this is something that's required rather than executing it each time, which is why we check var run reboot required to see if there's actually a need for the reboot. Next, I create my Ansible user. This is four tasks, one that creates the wheel group, one that checks if the user account is present and creates it and sets the password if not. The next adds the user Ansible to the wheel group and finally, we create the SSH key file for the Ansible user. I like to use a separate Ansible user because I intend to track changes that that user makes more closely with logging in the future and create a white list of IPs that that user can actually SSH from. This should decrease the amount of times that I'm using sudo with my account and instead allow my configuration changes to come from Ansible and the Ansible user. This next section is to set up some basic security settings I like on all of my Linux resources, such as disabling root login, disabling password authentication, remember this is why we tested our public key earlier, and changing the default SSH port number. Next, we create our inventory file. This is the list of resources that the Ansible playbook can reference and communicate with over SSH. For now, I'm just using the IPs of my Pies. I could use DNS here, but opted not to. The k 3 s header here is what we can reference in our playbook, and this will run each task against all of these IPs. In the future, I may have this pull the list of IPs from Netbox dynamically, but I haven't decided if that's the direction I want to go with this particular project. All right, that should do it for the first stage here. We have our baseline config for the Linux installation. I want to run this now, and once we verify that it all works as it should, we can move on to the next phase of actually doing the K3S installation. We run the playbook and, oh. oh my no, God! Okay, no. This isn't that big of a deal. We likely missed something in the formatting. This is YAML after all, which is pretty temperamental when it comes to formatting. I noticed I had a become prompt where I didn't need it and a misaligned the line. 
So fix those, that should take care of this issue. You can see that the colors of the lines in our task should match if they have the same indentation. So let's rerun our playbook and, well, that wasn't quite it. I went back and looked at another playbook I had where I was using this line and file module and I had to put the full module name in. So let's go ahead and do that here, test again, and that, well, that didn't do it either. I spent some time staring at this playbook until, there it is, it finally caught my eye. I was not indented the same on these last few tasks, so apparently the coloring in Visual Studio is only task by task and does not compare them to the rest of the playbook. So. We can go ahead and just add some indentation to these lower four tasks to make them match the rest of the playbook. Okay, now let's run this playbook. I think we got it. And this is not perfect, but progress. A different error. This error confuses me though, as this was an SSH error and we already tested that SSH pub key worked. I did my code review breathing exercises and light bulb. I created our inventory file for our playbook that creates the user Ansible. But in our inventory file, I told the playbook to use the username Ansible. How can it do this if the user doesn't exist yet? So I set this to the user account that I created when I imaged the pies, reran the playbook for the ninth time, and now we're getting somewhere. This is where that joke about why do something that takes 10 minutes when you could spend 10 hours automating it comes from. We can see here that we still get an error but this is because that one pie didn't boot. We could ignore any error for the .44 IP address until I get fed up with it and remove it from the inventory file later on. Unfortunately, at this point, I lost a bunch of footage where I figure out how to create Ansible tasks from the K3S install guide that I was referencing. So what we have here is the result of those efforts. And I will kind of run through these steps. First, we run the install script on the master node. That's the .41 IP. This task needs some work, as currently it's just a command line that runs every time the playbook is run. It doesn't seem to break anything rerunning the install script, but it's unnecessary. Then we pull the node token that is used for the worker nodes to join the cluster. Then we download the script to the worker nodes and run it with the parameters to join the cluster, including that token. We can see that it completes, and now we can log into the master node and run get nodes to see if we can see the workers have joined. And there they are. It's also worth noting that we designated a specific K3S version, as I think I may want to use Rancher to manage this, but Rancher has limited version compatibility. So I wanted to make sure that we were on a version that falls into the list of compatible versions. So that's gonna do it for today. We have our K3S cluster up and running. We can see that they are all joined and communicating properly, and we now have a playbook that we can use to always get back to this stage should something I do in the next part mess this up, which seems highly likely. That's it for today. Thanks for watching.